on the chart, square root is in blue, you've seen a general population decline over this time period. The next um, data set is on population by age, the distribution of age, and Shorewood, I hope you guys can all see this, but Shorewood is the light purple color, and the most important thing that you can see is the, the sort of very obvious um, overrepresentation in young adults in Shorewood relative to the MSA, which is the sort of middle purple color, and the USA, which is the far right column, uh, the darker color. So basically the primary distinction between Shorewood and these other, other areas of analysis here is that there are more young adults living in Shorewood. This is not something that should surprise you given the proximity to the university. Um, so the way that the census um, typically classifies households is there are family households and there are non-family households. Family households are defined as a household where two or more people who are related are living together. A non-family household would be unrelated persons, so it could be multiple unrelated persons living in a single household, or it could be a single person, in which case you're not family. Um, and so in Shorewood, you are, you are unique in the sense that there are more <coughs> non-family households in the Shorewood relative to these other areas now. So you'll see Shorewood on the far right, um, where there's a more even distribution between family households and non-family households when compared to the U.S., uh, Wisconsin, and NSA, which have a larger percentage of family households rather than non-family households. And this is primarily being driven by, again, that, that uh, college student uh, population here in Shorewood. They would be considered non-family households. Um, and also seniors who are living um, by themselves. The average household size in Shorewood, again, in the light purple on the, on the upper um, graph, you'll see that the average household size in Shorewood is smaller than the average household size in the MSA and the nation as a whole. On the bottom to the right, you'll see the actual distribution of one person, two person, three person, four person, and five person households. And you'll see that in Shorewood, the one and two person households are, um, are larger. The average uh, household size being smaller is actually being driven in large part by another trend that makes Shorewood unique, which is that there are more renter households here. And renter households in Shorewood are smaller than owner households. The average owner size household is 2.59 people. The average renter size household is 1.9. Here's a graph of the median household income trends. Shorewood, light purple, the, the line that's on the top. It starts in 2000 and it goes to the projected median household income for 2024 and what that's going to look like for Shorewood. As you can see, the median household income in Shorewood is higher than that than for the MSA and the nation as a whole. Um, and that the gap is projected to increase, not significantly, but slightly over the next five years. What, what impact did, did the student income have on this? The student, so that does impact student, the presence of students does in fact impact the, yeah. so in some ways that typically is suppressing um, income related yes, data yes. as opposed to, to what, so, to, to what percentage did it impact? I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I can look at that. I can but look you would say that Sherwood's income is lower because of our student population. Correct. As Correct. a general state. Well, it, this is, well, if you, if you remove students from the calculation of the area of median income, and you said, what is just the area of median income of all households net of the student population, yeah, that 76 would be higher, not lower. So that gap would actually be higher, depending. But you know that would also be true of the other areas, too, to the extent that there are college students living in, in these other regions. Does that make sense? Uh, so that, that effect is the same anywhere that there's a large college student population. But you said there's a larger population in Charlotte than other areas within the MSA. Of college students? Yes. Oh, oh, there's a larger population of non-family households in Shorewood, which is driven in part by the, the, by the college students. You didn't students. say in part, though, you said. Okay. In part, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. In part. What is the uh, population of students in Shorewood? Great question. That is a great question. I don't actually know that off the top of my head. Could you find that I out? Can, I can find that out. Yes, I'll make a note. Well, I'll make a note. I'll remember. Yes. Great question. Okay, so this, the next series of tables shows the actual in household income distribution by income level. So this table just gives you that overall number, the median household income. These tables give you by income bracket what the distribution is. So you'll see the lines, that, or the rows that are highlighted in gray are the sort of largest percentage of the population or households are, are in those rows. So all three areas, the highest percentage of people are plus, or households are clustering between $10,000 and $30,000 a year, and then there's another large percentage between $60,000 and $100,000 a year. This is comparable across all of the different areas. 
When we break that out just to look at the household income of seniors, so any household that has a senior who is 65 or older, you see a slightly different distribution, but again, a clustering sort of in the lower levels of the income distribution and then a large cluster in the middle of the income distribution. These are project, all, all household incomes similar to the median household income are projected to increase between 19, uh, 2019 and 2024. Um, the, main thing, the main difference that you'll see is this is the household income distribution for all households in 2019. Again, with the gray rows highlighted for the largest sort of clustering. And this is for 2024. So you see that increase in incomes. So in incomes are, are generally increasing across the distribution and the percentage of households that are, have incomes between 10 and 30,000 has now dipped below 10%. It's this still quite is, high. This is pretty fragmented. Other. You highlight 11.6, 11.5. It's a pretty fragmented group. The 11.5 fragmented group? No. Uh, if you look at the total, it's pretty fragmented within, that, within those salary ranges. Income. Right, if you mean fairly evenly distributed? Compared to other uh, other areas within the MSA, it, are they as fragmented as this? This, this distribution compared yes. to other areas? Yeah. That's another good question. I can look into that for you. Uh, this is not abnormal. I can say, just based on my experience in markets throughout the country, this is not an abnormal distribution to see sort of a large clustering in that lower income area and then in the middle income area. It's only 22%. No, no, no. But for those to be the largest, most represented. Yeah, but I'm looking at your high level. Right. So those and are like, got, you know, 10%. You've got students that, that don't count, they're 27%. Students, count, students are included in these numbers. Yeah, I understand that. So population for, and household projections is the next um, question. So as you'll see, this is a, this is a comparison. Uh, sure, we compare to another similar computer, so community Whitefish Bay. Um, which may um, speak to some of what you're asking. So as you can see in the upper left, uh, the Shorewood is in blue in all of these graphs. Um, the population in Shorewood is smaller, is less than it is in Whitefish Bay. Um, but the projections are relatively stable in Shorewood, moderate increase in Whitefish Bay. Household projections, Shorewood actually has more households than Whitefish Bay has. And what that means is that the average household size in Shorewood is actually in the final chart, lower or smaller than the average household size in Whitefish Bay. Those trends are all projected to continue over the next through, through 2040. So this table shows the percentage of renter-occupied units versus owner-occupied units in Shorewood relative to the other areas of comparison. This is something that I think everybody in Shorewood has, has known for quite some time, that there are more renter-occupied units in Shorewood relative to other um, similar, or in this case we're not comparing to similar housing markets, but other housing markets. Um, one thing that I will say is that when you compare the current uh, tenure patterns to those of the previous uh, data set, the percentage of owner-occupied housing units has decreased across all of these areas. So it's not uncommon during this time period for owner-occupied units to have decreased. Part of this could be the housing. The housing so market. Think, is that likely because of all the apartments that have been built? Well, no, I think this is the, this is so this I yeah, a very good question. The most recent data released from the Census Bureau is the 2013 to 2017 um, five-year averages. So for a community the size of Shorewood, you have to use a five-year average in order to get enough numbers to make any of their estimates valuable. Um, and so you and you don't want to compare overlapping five-year estimates. So you would not want to compare the 2012 to 2016 five-year average to the 2013 to 2017 average. Does that make sense? So you only want to compare things that are exclusive. So this is a comparison of the five-year average 2013 to 2017, which would be considered the current numbers by the Census Bureau, to the 2008 to 2012 five-year average. So the reason that I think this, that that is is just because of the housing uh, housing market crash. Because that 2008 to 2012 number includes things that were going on during that time period. But the most important thing here really is just that the, there are significantly more renter occupied housing units in Shorewood relative to other communities. So, this, so one of the things that we were specifically asked was what percentage of households have incomes below 80% of the area median income and below 50% of the area median income. This table illustrates the distribution by tenure pattern, so for owner-occupied households on the left, renter-occupied households on the right, um, and the, the distribution by income level. So these are things that are established by HUD, the area median income is set by HUD, 
and then they are adjusted for household size every year. And uh, I'm sorry, every, yeah, adjusted for household size every year. And you get these categories that are called extremely low income, so households that make anything below 30% of the area median income. Very low income households that make below 50% of the area median income. Low income households, households that make less than 60, uh, I'm sorry, 80% of the area median income. And then some people refer to them as moderate income households, other people refer to them as middle income households. Um, but those would be the 80 to 100% of the area median income. Do you know what the area median income is? I do. Oh. That question I can't answer. <laughs> In 2016, which, going back to this data, the most current data that was just released in August of this year for by HUD is actually using the 2012 to 2016 five-year average. So this data is for 2012 to 2016 five-year average. And there's a source on the bottom for anybody who's interested to get a sense of the different time periods for the different data sets. Um, they don't really, they're just a year behind the Census Bureau in terms of the data releases. So the ad, or the median household income in 2016 was 70,200. This top chart, this top chart gives you a sense of what those income limits would be. So when they say, for example, on the right, um, extremely low income, 26% of, of renter households, there's 845 of extremely low incomes, that would be renter households that have incomes below that far left column. Does that make sense? This, no, no, this is, this is HUD's income, uses HUD's um, median household income numbers, and there it's adjusted for household size, and Novogratz has a rent income calculator online where they do all those calculations. So these are established, it's not survey related data. This is set for this community, and it's countywide. Okay, um, if you have a, a rental unit with three people in it, all three are students, they're making $8,000 or $2,000 each a year, how did, how's that calculation put into these demographics? Is that three households or is that one household? It's one household. <coughs> but that wouldn't really be considered a hub. It's a it's a non-family. It's a non-family. Because they're unrelated. It's theoretically. It's theoretically, exactly. If they were related, then they would be a family house. Yeah. If you go back one, uh -huh. uh, is that? Oh, sorry. Uh, is that? Um, something you see in other places, like such a big difference between renter and owner? Yes, this is, it's not, there, and, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, but it's not that uncommon. If you think about it, to own a house, you generally just have a higher income. That's basically what this is saying. So if you're, if you're an owner, you're more likely to have incomes above the area, of the, the light sort of peach color. You're more likely to be in that over the area median income household. So it's, it's not a All right, so moving on to the economic stuff. Um, again, this is probably something that you guys know already, but um, the Shorewood economy is very much tied to that of the larger MSA. There are significant both inflows and outflows. Um, so in other words, what that means is that more people who work in Shorewood actually don't live here, and more people who live in Shorewood don't work here. The majority of people who live in Shorewood work somewhere else. The majority of people who work in Shorewood live somewhere else. Uh, most of that traffic, that inflow and outflow traffic, is coming from the south and southwest, so Milwaukee general area. Um, I will say this has not changed. I don't know if that's interesting to people, but this, the, the sort of general patterns of um, mobility economically have not changed since 2000, in term, which is when they started this. So, sorry, that only, you only know that going back to 2000. From this data set. You can ask, if, if you have a question, definitely ask, because if you have like, a question, I'm, I'm if, you're, if you're curious about previous years, let me know and I can look into it. Yeah, sure. it was like in the 60s, if it was the same, or... Right, right, right. Was, I, don't I don't know if I, I don't know if it goes back that far. I know this data set doesn't, but I could look and see if the census has anything. Yeah. Um, this, so again, because the, the economy in Shorewood is so interconnected to that of the larger MSA, um, we're sort of looking at that at economic trends at the MSA level, and um, the sort of left side of this of this table is showing in, uh, trends in the MSA, both total employment and the unemployment rate, and the right side is the national trends. Um, and essentially, the, the main point from this is just that in terms of total employment growth, the MSA has generally underperformed the nation, so they've added fewer jobs annually compared to the sort of national average, but the unemployment rate has been lower. 
So this graph shows the um, distribution of employment by industry. The light purple is shorewood. Um, and the, the sort of immediate takeaways you'll see is that nearly 50% of Shorewood's uh, residents are employed in three uh, primary industries, education, healthcare, social services, and professional scientific and, uh, technology, so professional services. These are employment projections, um, and it's kind of, it looks kind of blurry. Yeah. Okay. This is 3.5% is what they're projecting over a 10 year period. So it's from 2016 to 2026 is the way that they have it currently. Uh, and they're projecting employment growth over that period of 3.5%. So that's annual employment growth of less than 1%. So the projections are that the economy is going to slow. That's not, shouldn't be that surprising to anybody. Um, but what's good for Shortwood is that those three industries that I said are represent nearly half of the industries that the population of Shortwood is employed in are actually projected to increase. There's some of the some industries that are supposed to have the largest growth. So that's a good thing. I'll see if if the if that if when you guys look at the slides if that's still blurry, let me know. It didn't look blurry. All right. So moving on to the supply characteristics. Um, this section is going to talk generally about the housing market here in Shorewood, and then we will do the more specific stuff towards the latter end of this, the, this section. So this shows uh, the, the average housing vacancy rates in Shorewood relative to these other areas. Um, I'll start by saying, again, that same survey, the 2013 to 2017 five-year average, which is the most current data that's available from the Census Bureau, that is showing that there are 6,344 housing units in Shorewood. Of those, again, 45% 46, 46, give or take, percent are owner occupied and 54% are renter occupied. This is based on census data? All of this is, okay, when I say census, are you thinking 2010? I don't know. Okay. Don't know <laughs> census Bureau data, the Census okay. Bureau data. Okay. So the census, they do the, decen the, the decennial census every 10 years. So the, two, the last one, 2010, they're gearing up for the 2021 right now. But every year, they also collect what, in, in what's called the American Community Survey, a similar version of data, but they do it at, they collect it from a sample of, of households as opposed to from everyone. Um, it seems a little odd that the rental vacancy would be less than the homeowner occupancy for sure. I would think homeowner occupancy would be essentially zero <laughs> in short with not 1%. And vacancy, rental vacancy would not be so low. But that's what I'm just wondering. What right, right. Sure. Well, so one thing yeah, I could say is that it's low, but it's also this is also pre uh, pre all of those new properties that just came online in the past year or two because this is the five year average. Remember, stopping in 2017, so this doesn't have the oaks and short. It doesn't have all that new rental supply that you that was built. So it might be that this number will go up now that you have that new supply. I will come back to that in the latter section though when we talk about the actual survey that we did of all the existing rental properties in short, where the, the vacancy rate is actually still quite low amongst those yeah. There also are margin errors with the yeah. survey that, you know, these, the 0.9 points are going to easily flip up that margin error, so. Yes, yeah. so that 0.9 yeah. is not, it is not distinguishable from that 1.3. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So I will only, the, the, when I say this is different from this, it would only be taking into consider those margins of error, this is distinguishable. So the age of housing structures in Shorewood, this was interesting to me, but again, it probably will not be for you who live here. Um, just how much of the housing stock in Shorewood was built prior to 1939 um, relative to other markets. Um, on, on just how little of the housing stock was, has been built since 1970, only 3.1% relative to about 20 to 30% in other areas. But again, this does not take into consideration those new additions of which there have been quite a few in the past few years. So that number, that number, sort of that new so housing stock number is going to go up. All housing, any housing. Correct, all housing. Family, yep, yep. Now we get to the distinction of multifamily versus what types of housing. So here you see that the majority of the housing stock in Shorewood is in fact single family detached, which would be the far, the column on the far left, um, and the second largest percentage is large multifamily, which would be this 20 or more units, followed by duplexes. I don't think that that would be too surprising. Now this shows the, ho the housing structure by tenure patterns. So where do renters live relative to owners in terms of that, the, house the housing types? 
And what you see here, again, it probably is not surprising to, to many of you, but owners primarily live in single-family detached houses. Um, renters are more evenly distributed, but many of them are in duplexes and then the, the multi-family. There are very few renters living in the single-family uh, detached housing, which that is actually something that, that is unique to Shorewood too. In other markets, we typically see that number is higher. But that's probably because you guys have such a large duplex supply, which sort of competes with us for renters. So this is the, the distribution by bedrooms. Again, Shorewood is in light purple. The primary differences here are the large number of one-bedroom units that comprise Shorewood's housing stock relative to these other areas. So one thing that I heard in one of the listening sessions was a concern that the large renter population um, was uh, more likely to move really frequently and that that was going to cause disruption to the community. Um, and so I included this just to give a sense of what those patterns actually look like for a renter household as opposed to owner households. And the yellow and the green are the U.S. Um, and the, I'm sorry, yeah, white green. It's hard to actually show. Anyway. Um, the main point here is that you see the renters that are popping up in the in this, where the majority of the renters moved in between 2010 and 2014. The majority of the owners moved into their housing unit between 2000 and 2009. So it's not as big of a difference as you might think. It's about give or take 10 years. That that that's reasonable given that the homeowners are actually investing in buying a house. Um, but it's not renters are not moving every single year the way that that it seemed like some people were were talking. Instead, the vast majority of renters in Shorewood moved in between 2010 and 2014. So at a minimum, they've been there for three years. So this chart shows the value of owner-occupied units, as well as the median home values up in the box on the left. Um, the main takeaways here are that Shorewood's median home value is significantly higher than that for other communities. Um, it's $330,800, um, and that is uh, significantly higher than the previous estimate, which was, again, from that 2008 to 2012 time period, which was 288700 So it was quite a big uh, increase over that time period in terms of the median home values. Um, the other thing that you'll notice is just how skewed the distribution is for Shorewood to the higher end home, home values, as opposed to the distributions of the other communities, which are more normally distributed around that $200,000 median range. So this chart shows sort of the similar information as the last one, but now for renters as opposed to owners. And here you see, um, that, again, Shorewood light purple, the median gross rent in Shorewood, and again, gross rent, for those of you who, are, who don't know, is housing costs all-inclusive, so that's how much you pay for your rent plus how much you pay for your utilities as a package. Um, the median gross rent in Shorewood is $948. Again, that's significantly higher than it was in the previous data set, which was $846. So, Housing costs across the board, whether you're an owner or a, or a renter, have increased. Um, and again, here you see uh, quite, a, quite a bit more uh, rental units in the $1,000 to $1,500 range relative to the other areas, and then quite a, few, quite a bit lower number of, or percentage of uh, rental units between the $500 and $1,000 range. Okay, so HUD defines cost burdens as any household that spends more than 30% of their income towards housing costs. So again, for renters, that would be your asking rent plus your utilities. If you spend more than 30% of your household income on that, then you're considered cost burdened by HUD. If you spend more than 50% of your household income on those things, then you're considered severely cost burdened. Okay? For owner households, it's similar in that it's your housing costs, all inclusive, but this would be your mortgage, your property taxes, your utilities. So this chart shows the, by, by number, so by count, um, the number of households who are cost burdened, which would be the uh, light, lighter versions of the colors, and then the severely cost burdened, so the people who are paying more than 50% would be the darker colors. And this is by income distribution. So the far, uh, the far sort of section is the extremely low income households. So this is renters, for example, light green, there's 500 and something extremely low income renters who are cost burdened. That means there's 500 and something extremely low income renters who are paying more than 30% of their household income towards their housing costs. This is the MSA? No, this is for short. Sure. Sure. So, what you take away from this is renters are more likely to be cost burdened, right? That's the way that, that you see this. But, I will say, 
that that map counts matter, so sort of the aggregate number matters, but percentages and being disproportionately likely to have this, or to, to find yourself in this situation also matters. So this chart shows percentage of people within that category who are cost burden. So you'll see in this chart, it's almost, the, it, it's almost opposite, it looks like, when you look at it, trend-wise. So the orange colors here are owners. Orange color here are owners. See how green is higher here, orange is higher here. That's because there aren't as many owner households in that lower end of the income distribution. Remember when we were talking about that before, that their, their owners are more likely to be above 100% of the area median income? So there aren't as many, but owners that are, that do find themselves with lower incomes are extremely likely to end up being cost burdened. Did everybody follow that? Now, can you give it to us? Try one more time. Okay. Yeah, please. Sorry. No, 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 no. I, it's very it is complicated. So there are more renters in general who find themselves who are who, who are yeah. cost burdened. Yeah. Yes. But if you are a homeowner and you have an extremely low income, so you're in that far left column, yeah. almost 100% of those homeowners are cost burdened. Do we have a number of that? Yes, I believe it's around 64, 65. So, so it's not very many. households is about 60. Yes, so exactly. About 60 people that are extremely co cost burden and extremely low income. Yes. Okay. So, the, so that's why I'm showing both the counts. You'll see that see, you can kind of see that light, light sort of salmon color on the far left. Those are counts. So it's about 64, 65, mm -hmm. but 100 percent of them almost are yeah. cost burden. Do you have a sense of if that's by by age, like if, if those are fixed income kind of situations? That, that would be exactly what I would assume. Uh, they don't provide this district this data set broken out by uh, that's age. That's an assumption. But, yeah, yeah. So that's what I was asking. asking if yeah. that might yeah. be the case. And when you look at taxes, taxes convert. It's an assumption, and it's an assumption based on the tax the tax the amount of property taxes yeah. here. So it just makes sense that if you are living on an income of you know. $16,000 a year and your property tax bill comes in it's $9,000. And you also have a mortgage. You know, you're right. you're extremely now you're in that dark orange column. Yeah. Do you have the data set for 13 through 17? Oh, yeah. No, it has not been released yet. So this it, this comes out it came out in August of this year. So it'll probably be August of next year before this comes out. But can we get a turn from the last the last so uh, you know 7 8 to 12 and then 12 to 16. You can indeed. Oh. Here is my next slide. <laughs> I'm very happy to say I can answer this question. Um, this this shows the trends in, and this I will say is the American Community Survey for the 2013 to 2017. So this is a different. It's different from this. The data sources are the same, but the way that they're compiled are slightly differently. And HUD is, is the is the sort of entity that that compiles this Chaz data. And they're just they're the, a year behind the Census Bureau in terms of the district, uh, the release of their data set. HUD is the one that produces this data set where it's really fine grained, where you can say by each income level how are the cost burdens experienced. Here, all with the American Community Survey, all we get is by tenure. So this this won't tell us extremely low income owner occupied households how did how did that compare. But this does tell us owners with a mortgage. That's the top the top rows, um, and it compares the first column is the current estimates compared to the previous estimates, would be the second column, and the third column, which is the one you care about, is whether or not that relationship is statistically, those numbers are statistically significantly different. So what you see is that, for example, the asterisk um, on the, about row five, shows that the current estimate of homeowners with a mortgage who are paying more than 35% of their income in housing costs is 19%. That's what they're estimating right now. The previous estimate was 27.4. So, and then the asterisk indicates that this is in fact statistically different. So that, that it has in fact decreased. So you might see decreases or increases in the point estimates because these are estimates and there's margins of error associated with those estimates. It might look like a difference, but it's not necessarily a difference. It's not statistically distinguishable. The asterisk is what tells you that it is. So that asterisk tells you, yes, in fact, homeowners with a mortgage here in Shorewood have they, they now, there are fewer of them now paying more than 35% of their income than there were five years ago. So that's something that's kind of interesting because most people, like, that was interesting to me because I think of housing costs and all of the other data is showing housing costs going up. So that tells you that there's something about incomes that are going on here where the incomes are going up faster than the housing costs may be going up. Or the low income people are moving. 
or people are being displaced. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This does not say this is not the same set of households from here to here. Exactly. The population. So the main things that are different here, again, the only real um, the only real change that you see in terms of cost burdens actually is a decline in the percentage of owner occupied households who are cost burdened. Owner occupied households who have mortgage. Okay, so we've talked about HUD's version of affordability, the cost burden being less than 30% and the sphere being less than 50%. There's another group of people who are another sort of school of thought that says, actually, housing is not indistinguishable from transportation. Where you choose to live is in, or where you choose to live impacts your transportation costs. So really we should be talking about affordability as how much you spend on housing and your transportation. Because you might have to move an hour away from where you work in order to get cheaper housing, but now your transportation costs have gone up because of that choice. And so they say we really should be talking about affordability as a function of housing plus transportation costs as opposed to just housing costs. And this just gives you a sense of the distinction between those two definitions. So on the left is the traditional definition, approximately 34% of households are paying, are sort of cost burdened in the traditional definition. In short words, when you, um, when you go to the housing plus transportation cost definition, you get 53% of households who are cost burdened. national trends, statewide trends, MSA trends. This compares Shorewood to other villages and cities that were considered sort of similar to Shorewood. Um, and this starts with the home values. Shorewood is the one to the furthest to the right. It's kind of a brownish color. Um, the next color over is Whitefish Bay. Green is the Wauwatosa, and then Milwaukee is yellow, and Glendale is orange. And essentially what you see here is sort of the distribution of home values in Shorewood and Whitefish Bay are more skewed to the upper ends, which is consistent probably with what you would, uh, what, what you guys think of in terms of housing values, that Whitefish Bay and, and Shorewood are, have higher home values than a place like Milwaukee, um, which are more skewed towards the lower end of this distribution. Similar, again, same, same chart, but now for rents as opposed to home values. Um, and again, you see sort of Shorewood and Whitefish Bay having more on this the, the right side of the graph as opposed to the left side of the graph, so higher cost rental housing as opposed to uh, more lower cost rental housing in some of these other areas. Here's a comparison of going back to that traditional definition of cost burden um, in Shorewood relative to these other communities, and we have it separated out by owners with a mortgage, owners without a mortgage, and renters. And what you see here is that, again, Shorewood and Whitefish Bay are on the right sides of these um, columns. And um, what, you end up, what you see is the renters in Shorewood and Whitefish Bay are actually, even though they're more likely to experience a cost burden than owners within Shorewood, when you compare that to other communities, renters in Shorewood actually are less likely to be cost burden relative to renters in other communities. Wait to make sure I'm not, okay. Got it? <laughs> And then the owners, the owners with a mortgage and uh, owners without a mortgage are, owners with no mortgage are actually, there's no distinction in that, in that category. Um, and the, it kind of, I put here, the margins of error are quite large here, so what appears to be a difference is not in fact a difference. And that's that, set, that middle set of, of, of um, bars. It kind of looks like Shorewood might be a little bit less, but it's actually not, they're not. They're not. Um, all right, so then again, housing and transportation costs, that going back to the people who say affordability really should be defined as housing plus transportation as opposed to just housing. Here you see um, Shorewood compared to these other communities. 
And in fact, the sort of percentage of households that are that would be living in an unaffordable situation by this definition in Shorewood is quite a bit less than white fish bay. Alright, so now moving on to the we have until eight or eight thirty. Eight. Eight, okay. So I'm going to go, so this is, uh, we'll talk about the for sale market quickly. Um, this is just general trends in sales prices within Shorewood um, since 2000, October 2000, so about the past two years. Um, and the, the basic takeaway here is that there's been an increase overall on average in the median sale price in Shorewood over that two year period. I don't think that's surprising to anyone. Um, but typically we try to take these, this kind of data with a grain of salt because this data depends on what product sells what product is, becomes available. And so while median sales prices are a, an important indicator, you know, if you have two two million dollar homes that sell out of 20, then now you're, it looks like you've had this astronomical increase in your median sale price when in fact, um, you know, it might not be as significant as it seems. So we typically also look at what's called the Zillow Home Value Index. And what they do is they have an algorithm that projects what would the cost of every single product within this community be if it were all to sell in this year? And then what does that trend look like? So that's what this graph is. Shorewood is red, Whitefish Bay is green, Wauwatosa is yellow, Glendale is blue, and Milwaukee is purple-ish. Um, and again, you see Shorewood and Whitefish Bay following very similar trend lines, um, with Whitefish Bay being slightly higher than Shorewood. Same graph, but for condos, so I should have said this also separates out single family only as opposed to condos because that can skew the numbers too. If you have a market where there's a lot of condos, condos generally sell for less than single family homes, then that's, a, that's not, not the best comparison. So we, we separated out single family homes, which is this graph, from condos, which is this graph. Um, and again, all of them are increasing. Uh, Whitefish Bay is the green, so condos and Shorewood is red. So in this case, the, the, the sort of value of condos in Shorewood has actually gone up quite a bit more than the value of condos in Whitefish Bay. This graph just shows the number of sales um, in each market, and it's kind of skewed because obviously uh, the communities are slightly different in size. But uh, what you what you see is Shorewood, the red line, which is sort of uh, fluctuating in the bottom, generally going between 20 and 30 sales per, per year. This is uh, the, the number of homes that are currently for sale in Shorewood. Again, it's comparable to that previous chart. Um, they're currently, according to this, uh, 18. This is the average days on the market. So one of the things that we think about when we think about demand is, well, when something comes on the market, how long does it sit there? The shorter that it sits there, the higher the demand in general is, is the way that the theory would go. And so this shows the sort of the average days on the market for single family homes and condos in 2015 compared to 2019 year to date average for those two things. What you see is that in both cases, the average time on the market for both single family homes and condos has decreased quite substantially. This is short 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 yeah. All right, so general conclusions, gaps in the market here, Affordable homes priced at below 200 to 300,000, aka starter homes. There's not a lot of that housing supply here in Shorewood. Um, new construction and or fully updated housing supply. There's not a lot of that here in Shorewood um, that comes on the market. And uh, senior friendly housing supply was the third gap that, that people identified. So products that are, and specifically I should say, there are obviously condos and now there are luxury apartments. Um, and we did hear from property managers that seniors are downsizing into those luxury apartments too. So there are some seniors who are choosing to sell and then move into a renter, uh, a rental situation. Um, but specifically, this was more: is is that enough? Given the fact that the population is aging so quickly here, and also there's no single single story ranch style design. Yeah, this is also wishes, right? Oh yes, absolutely. This has nothing to do with reality. This well, is this is. Uh, I wish. Homes here cost two hundred thousand dollars. Oh, I oh. wish there were range style homes. I would, I would identify it more as there. These are gaps in the sense that these don't exist. So yes, I wish, but also it's a gap because there is not very much. Oh, I mean, there's a gap because it's not affordable to do anything. Oh, that's entirely possible. Yes, I'm not, I'm not giving an explanation for the mechanism why there's a gap. Just that there is so, that gap. Wish it was. But the data does support that there is a gap. Okay, got it. But yes. I like that a million dollars. 
All right, moving on to the rental market. So I'm going to quickly talk about um, special needs housing, duplexes, subsidized income-based housing, and market rate housing. Um, in the interest of time, I'll probably just go through kind of quickly on this, but special needs housing, bottom line, there isn't any here. Um, this is the, the, these kinds of, this housing product is typically offered either by a nonprofit or some kind of government subsidy. Um, this comes from the housing authority of the city of Milwaukee, and this shows the um, sort of spatial distribution of the special needs um, housing developments that they have for uh, adults. So not necessarily seniors, but adults, so ages 18 and over. And there are none in Shorewood, the closest ones are to the south and to the west. All right, so one of the questions that we had was, um, what's going on with the dupe, like, what is going on with the duplex situation in Shorewood? Should we continue to advocate for the duplex conversion program? Is there demand for that program? Is there demand for the duplex product in general? Um, what I will say is the short version of this is that it seems like actually from everything that we've seen, there's quite a bit of demand for this product. Um, some of that is coming from investors who see it as a very lucrative uh, rental market, so they're interested in buying those. Uh, real estate agents that we, that we talk to, and I will say it's not very many, and we're hoping to get more, so anybody who knows one that, that would be willing to talk to me, please come see me afterwards. But um, indicated that this is a product that investors really like. They see Shorewood as a very strong rental market, and, um, and they typically come to the table with cash offers, and so then even though the duplex product is desirable in some cases by people who intend to actually occupy it as an owner, they oftentimes their, their uh, bids are not competitive because they're coming in with a financing contingency as opposed to an all cash transaction. And so these these are being bought up, you know, more by investors as opposed to people who intend to to occupy them. But it's not necessarily because people don't want to occupy them as owners. It's more it's more driven by this financing and and um, demand coming from the investor market. You're saying landlords are buying up properties in Charlotte student population renters, that sort of thing? Uh, yes, it could be that. It could be for students. It could also be for families and young professionals who want to live in Shorewood for the school district, and they want more of that sort of single family design kind of housing, but they can't afford to buy it, or they can't afford to or find a single family home themselves to rent, but they would prefer the duplex as opposed to a sort of luxury market rate apartment in a high rise. All right, so subsidized housing, there's there's one, well, there's two properties here, but they're the same, two faces of the same property, River Park. Uh, there's 427 apartments there. They're all one bedroom units. They are all age-restricted, so you have to be either 62 and over to live there or 55 and over with a disability. So one thing that's unique about this is that a lot of other um, Section 8 properties that are for, specifically for seniors will have um, units that are set aside for people who are non who are below 55 but have a disability, and here there is a, there is a restriction where you have to, if, you, if you're trying to get in because you have a disability, you still have to be at least 55 years old. Um, there's a priority here for extremely low income households. This is one reason why you have a bunch of extremely low income renters in Shorewood, because you have 427 units at this property, and they're all occupied, well, not all, but almost exclusively by those extremely low income renters. Um, if they can't find an extremely low income renter who is applying, then they can rent them to a very low income renter. Still, those income limits are quite low. But these wouldn't represent the cost burden renters that you were referring to. No, this would no, no. This would just be that the fact that there were more in that initial like pie chart kind of graph when she had asked if there why there were if that was similar. Um, Is um, but no, these are by definition not these are by definition affordable. People who live in these units pay 